In these last few sessions, we've looked at three ingredients, the risk-free rate, the equity risk premium, what you demand for the average risk investment, and a measure of relative risk, a beta, so to speak. All of those ingredients go into establishing a cost of raising equity funding for a business. But remember, there's a second way in which you can raise funding for most businesses, which is to borrow money. In this session, we will try to answer two basic questions. First, what is debt? Sounds like a simple question, but the answer is not always that easy. The second, what is the cost of that debt? Once we can establish those two pieces, we have all of the ingredients in estimating what the overall cost of funding is for any business, a cost of capital. A cost of capital is a weighted average of what it costs you to raise equity and what it costs you to borrow money. That mix is what we will use in valuing entire businesses. Last three sessions, we've laid the three ingredients that you need to estimate cost of equity on the table. You need a risk-free rate, you need a measure of an equity risk premium, which is what you demand for the average risk investment. You need a beta, measure of relative risk. All of those things will feed into a cost of equity. But remember, equity is only one way in which you can raise capital to fund a business. The other, of course, is debt. So in this session, let's talk a little bit about, first, what we would categorize as debt, and second, how we would attach a cost to that debt. So let's start with the basic question. What exactly is debt? The answer seems simple, right? Just look on the balance sheet. It's whatever the accountant calls debt, if it were only that simple. So let me give you the three criteria that I use to categorize something as debt. Here's the first one. Debt gives rise to contractual commitments. Commitments you've got to meet in good times and commitments you've got to make in bad times. Second, those commitments tend to be tax deductible. That's what separates it from equity. And third, if you fail to make those commitments, bad things happen to you. As a company, you might be pushed into default or have to give up voting rights to those people. So fixed commitment, tax deductible, loss of control, those are the things I go looking for when I decide to categorize something as debt. Using those criteria, let's go through a balance sheet to see what would meet those criteria. Obviously, all interest-bearing debt meets the criteria, short-term as well as long-term. Bank loans and corporate bonds, they're all debt. Accounts payable and supplier credit come close, but here's where they don't meet the criteria. When you use supplier credit, here's what you're often doing. Your supplier tells you you can pay in five days or 55. By choosing to pay in 55 days, you get to use the credit, but what you often lose is a discount. In other words, there's an implicit interest expense associated with using accounts payable and supplier credit. If you're willing to make those implicit expenses into explicit expenses, then you can treat accounts payable and supplier's credit as debt, but that's really difficult to do. It basically means you've got to go through the cost of goods sold and tell me how much you lost in discounts because you used that credit. And if you're, if you're up for that, then I'm up for treating supplier credit and, and accounts payable as debt. Underfunded pension obligations, healthcare obligations, well, to classify them as debt, you've got to follow through. You've got to figure out what happens if you have an underfunded pension obligation. In the U.S., for instance, when you have an underfunded pension obligation, you have to show that on your balance sheet, but there's no teeth to the law. It's not like you have to come up with one-fifth or one-tenth of that amount every year for the next five or ten years. If that were the case, I would treat them as debt. And in some countries, I think you should. In the U.S., though, because you have no contractual commitment following up from that underfunding, I would not include it as debt. So on the balance sheet, in, for U.S. companies at least, I would stop with interest-bearing debt. But here's the catch. There are items off the balance sheet that meet these criteria. And I want to be mysterious. If you're a retail firm in the U.S., you know what a primary form of debt is? You take leases, long-term leases, 10-year, 12-year, 15-year leases. Think of why they're debt. A lease contract is a contractual commitment. It's tax deductible, and if you fail to make that lease payment, initially you lose that site, but if you fail on a bunch at the same time, you go bankrupt. So technically, when you think about debt, it should include all interest-bearing debt and all long-term commitments like lease commitments that essentially bind you to making those payments in good times and in bad. So let's follow up that and think about the cost of debt. The cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money long-term today. Two key words there, long-term. In other words, I don't care if your debt is three-month debt, six-month debt, one-year debt, two-year debt. I'm going to consolidate all this debt and act like it's long-term debt. And here's why I'm going to do that. In most markets, the term structure is upward sloping. You're saying, so what? If I let you give me your cost of debt based on what you actually pay in your borrowing, you know what you're going to be inclined to do to lower your cost of capital? You're going to replace all your long-term debt with short-term debt. Now, you can choose to do that 
But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to still attach long-term cost of debt to it because I'm implicitly going to assume that the rolled-over cost of your short-term debt is roughly that of your long-term debt. The other key word was today. In other words, if I ask you what your cost of debt is, don't tell me what you borrowed money at two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. It's a rate at which you can borrow money today. So you break it down. Here's, what's, here's what should go into your cost of debt. There should be a risk-free rate from which you build off plus a default spread. You're saying, what's a default spread? That's how much a bank or a bondholder will charge you over and above the risk-free rate because they're worried they will not get paid because of credit risk. Now, how do you come up with that default spread? I'll take you through the easy scenarios first, and then we'll talk about the difficult ones. If your company has a rating, a rating from S&P or Moody's, then I'm going to cheat. I'm going to assume that the ratings agency has done its job and that what they give me as a rating measures your default risk. So if you're a triple B rated company, I should be able to come up with a default spread based on your rating, add that onto your risk-free rate, call that your cost of debt, and move on. In fact, if you have bonds outstanding and they're publicly traded and they're liquid, I could probably look up the interest rate on a bond issued by you, though the danger is that gives me the interest rate on the specific bond, not the interest rate for all of the debt of the company. Risky companies can issue safe bonds by carving out safe assets to back up that bond. But those are the easy cases. You're saying, what if I have a company that does not have a rating? Let's face it, 90 to 95% of all publicly traded companies will not come with a nice, convenient bond rating. You still need a cost of debt. So I'm going to take you through a process that you can use to estimate a cost of debt for a non-rated company. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to act like a ratings agency, and you're going to attach a rating to this company. I'm going to call it a synthetic rating to separate from an actual rating. I'm going to base my rating by looking at financial ratios. After all, that's what the ratings agencies use anyway to come up with the rating. In fact, I'm going to be simplistic and base your entire rating on one ratio. The ratio I'm going to use is the interest coverage ratio. It's your operating income divided by interest expenses. If you're a lender, you want this number to be a high number. The higher the number, the safer a borrower. So you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, I'll back into a rating based on that interest coverage ratio. So you take Embraer, for instance. In 2004, the interest coverage ratio you come up with is 3.56, based on their operating income and their interest expense. Actually, I should draw your attention to how I came up with the 3.56, because it, it should reveal something about this process. I could have used the operating income from the most recent year, but that might give me a misleading view of the risk in the company. After all, when you lend to a company, you don't lend in the bad times or just in the good times. You lend across times. So I actually used an average operating income to try to capture some of that you know, stability or instability in earnings over time. So my job with Embraer now is to convert that interest coverage ratio of 3.56 into a rating. And here's how I'm going to do it. I have a lookup table I've developed by looking at just rated companies. And here's what I do. I look up the rating for companies. I look up their interest coverage ratio. And then I try to do some reverse engineering. In other words, I try to figure out if I can estimate what the rating will be given your interest coverage ratio. I actually have two sets of tables, one for large market cap companies. These are companies with an interest with market cap greater than $5 billion, and one for small market cap companies. Embraer in 2004, for instance, was, was a small market cap company, and that's the table I'm going to use to come up with its interest coverage ratio and rating. The interest coverage ratio of 3.56, given the lookup table then, would have yielded a rating of A- minus for Embraer. That is my synthetic rating for Embraer. And the default spread that goes with that rating is 1%. I'm almost home. Let's say I wanted to get a cost of debt for Embraer. I have a risk-free rate. Since I'm doing everything in U.S. dollars, that risk-free rate will be a U.S. dollar risk-free rate. I have the default spread for Embraer. Now, normally, I would just add those two and say that's the cost of debt for Embraer. But here's the one thing I'd be missing if I did that. Embraer is a Brazilian company. When investors buy bonds in Brazilian companies, they saddle with two types of default risk. One is the default risk of the company. The other is the default risk of the country in which the company is. It's, it's not fair. If you're a company in a risky market, you carry two burdens on your shoulder. So here's what the cost of debt works out for Embraer. My risk-free rate is 4.25%. To that, I add two numbers. One is the 1% default spread for Embraer as a company. And the other is at least a portion of the country risk. Why only a portion? Embraer gets lots of its revenues in U.S. dollars. I think it's unfair to saddle Embraer with the entire country risk portion, which is 6%. I've added two-thirds of that 6% on 
based on looking at other companies which are like Embraer, getting a lot of their revenues in dollars to come up with the cost of debt for Embraer. So risk-free rate in US dollars, because I'm doing everything in US dollars, plus a default spread for the country, plus a default spread for the company, gives me a cost of debt for Embraer as a company. So now that we have a cost of equity and a cost of debt for a company, we've got to bring them together in an overall cost of capital. And to make that estimate, we need weights for equity and weights for debt. Those weights, if you're doing valuation, should be market value weights. As opposed to what? As opposed to book value weights. Why market value weights? It's not because we assume that the market is right. That's not the right rationale. It's because that's what it will cost you to buy the company today. So whether you like what the market price is or, not, is or not, when you go out and buy shares in this company, or you buy the equity in the company, you have to pay the market price. So the way to think about the market value weights is it's the cost of acquiring this entire business. So let me try this for Embraer, and this in a sense summarizes much of what we've been saying over these last few sessions. For the cost of equity, I start with the risk-free rate. I chose to do my cost of capital in US dollar terms because my cash flows were in US dollars, so my risk-free rates here are US T bond rates. The beta that I've used for Embraer is a bottom-up beta. It reflects the fact that it's in the aerospace business. And the initial equity risk premium I've used is a mature market premium. But to that, I've added a country risk premium and a lambda measuring Embraer's exposure to country risk. Those numbers come together to give me a cost of equity. To get the cost of debt, I used the approach I described earlier in this session to come up with a pre-tax cost of debt. Then I looked at the tax benefit Embraer gets from debt. Now remember how this tax benefit works. Interest saves you taxes at the margin. So to compute the tax benefit, you should be using a marginal tax rate. As opposed to what? As opposed to an effective tax rate. The marginal tax rate might not be in your financial statements. It comes from the tax score. That number for Brazil is 34%, the tax rate. That's what I use to get the after-tax cost of debt. The weights for debt and equity reflect their respective market values. For equity, it's simple. Share price times number of shares. For debt, I did a little tweaking. Embraer's debt was not publicly traded, but I took the book value of debt, took the interest expense, and since I knew what the average maturity of the debt was, I estimated a market value for the debt. Sounds mysterious, right? But it's pretty simple to do. If you can estimate the market price for a bond, you can estimate the market value for all debt. And here's what you're going to do. Where well, you have the, the face value of the bond, introduce the book value of your debt. Where well, you have the coupon rate, enter the interest expenses for your debt. Where well, you have the maturity of the bond, enter the weighted average maturity of your debt then use the market interest rate you computed, the pre-tax cost of debt, as your discount rate to discount those cash flows back. That's what I used as my market value of debt. It might sound like a lot of work for very little, but it'll save you some trouble down the road. The weighted average of my cost of equity and cost of debt is my overall cost of capital. Now, I've assumed there are only two ways you can raise capital, debt or equity. You're saying, what if I have securities that don't fit easily into either bucket? Those are hybrids. There are a couple of very widely used examples of hybrids. One is convertible debt. Convertible debt is part debt, part equity. The debt portion, of course, is the bond. The equity portion is the conversion option. If you have convertible debt, my advice to you is separate it into conversion option and debt. Take the conversion option, throw it in with equity. Take the debt portion, throw it in with debt. Your problem goes away. Preferred stock is a little messier. It looks a lot like debt because it is a fixed dividend, but it does not give you a tax advantage, so you can't throw it in with debt, and you definitely can't throw it in with an equity. It's one of the few cases where you might want to open a third element in your cost of capital, and the cost of preferred stock is just your preferred dividend yield. So the end of the process, you're looking to come up with the cost of capital for your overall company. So let's summarize. When you have to estimate the cost of capital, you first have to estimate the cost of each element in the cost of capital, the cost of equity and the cost of debt, and if you have preferred stock, the cost of preferred stock. Then you have to attach weights to those numbers, and those weights should generally be market value numbers. Market value of equity, market value of debt, and market value of preferred stock. Just make sure your weights add up to one. At the end of the process, you will have a composite cost of financing your firm, a cost of capital. That is what you will use as your discount rate if you're discounting cash flows the entire business. Of course, you might choose to discount cash flows to equity, in which case you can stick with the cost of equity. But having the elements in place will give you a much better estimate of value for this business.